Another way to look at a patient is as an organism that develops and which has a sensitive period early in life where environment has a big impact. That takes us into the developmental origins of health and disease. If we look at adaptability on different time scales, we can see that the homeostatic mechanisms of physiology that are doing things like controlling our temperature and our sugar content in our blood are operating on periods that are from about a ten thousandth of a generation up to about a hundredth of a generation. If we look at rheostatic mechanisms, which signify changes in set points for homeostatic feedback, then the rheostatic mechanisms are on a slightly longer time scale, up to about a tenth of a lifespan. Developmental plasticity is something that has a time scale that runs from about a hundredth of a lifespan up to a full lifespan. And then natural selection, which is generating adaptation rather than adaptability, is something that's operating on a time scale from about a generation up to hundreds of generations. Many of the non-infectious diseases, the chronic diseases, originate early in development. Autoimmune diseases and atopies are examples. If the developing organism does not experience its normal symbionts, their evolved interactions with the immune system don't take place, and that leads to an abnormal immune response. We will expand on this. As for cancer, the somatic mutations that lead to cancer are most influential when they occur early in development, when cell division is rapid, and when the downstream influence is greatest. The metabolic syndrome, which we're going to go now go into some detail on, basically points out that condition at birth affects the probability, years later, of type 2 diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and cardiovascular disease. And this can happen even 50 to 60 years after the initial proximate cause has had its effect. There were two early hypotheses for the metabolic syndrome. James Neal uh, offered the thrifty genotype hypothesis. It was based on genetic determinism. He was trying to explain why diabetes exists at all. And his, he posited that a condition of insulin resistance would have been beneficial if people had repeatedly been exposed to starvation. The problem is that famines do not appear to have been frequent among hunter-gatherers. Hunter Hunter-gatherers are not obese, but they are very rarely starving. David Barker, 30 years later, offered the thrifty phenotype hypothesis. Instead of genetic determinism, Barker was using developmental determinism. He tried to explain why the metabolic syndrome is more frequent in adults who are undernourished as fetuses and infants. And the idea of the thrifty phenotype hypothesis is that a developmental switch gets thrown that puts the physiology of the developing organism into a very thrifty state, an insulin resistant state, and that that helps to protect it against a starvation regime. The problem with that is that predicting the adult environment on the basis of fetal nourishment might not work. The correlation between the food environments might not be high enough. However, we do have data. The effects really are real. And the most striking data that really focused people on this problem come from the Dutch hunger winter. At the end of 1944, the Nazis decided that they were going to starve the Dutch. And this famine lasted from about November of 1944 through into about April of 1945. And there were women in the Netherlands who were pregnant at the time. And they were either at the start of the famine, in late pregnancy, or in mid-pregnancy, or in early pregnancy. And the exposure to the famine came basically right here. Then the pregnancies concluded at, at these dates later on. <coughs> so people before and after were unexposed. The Dutch followed this. and. These are the characteristics 
measured in adults about 50 years later that are broken down by timing of prenatal exposure to the Dutch famine. And you have late gestation, mid gestation, and early gestation in these columns. It's a large column of numbers and you can study it at your leisure, but to pick out the main points, when that stress occurred mattered. And it makes sense because organ systems are developing at different times in pregnancy. Those who experienced starvation early in gestation later had cardiovascular disease and general poor health. Those who experienced in mid gestation later had a higher risk of kidney disease that was associated with diabetes and with lung disease. And those who experienced it in late gestation developed insulin resistance and diabetes later in life. Now, similar effects occur under normal conditions. David Barker looked at data from hospitals in Hertfordshire, and he looked at the relative risk of heart disease as a function of birth weight here on the x-axis and weight at one year over here on the y-axis. It's normalized to a risk of one for people who had mean birth weight and mean weight at one year. And what you can see is that the smaller the infant was, the higher the risk of heart disease. And the larger the infant was, the lower the risk of heart disease. These are quite dramatic differences. This is one and a half times as probable, and this is half as probable of having heart disease. What are the mechanisms that might mediate such effects? Well, they have to be epigenetic uh, because this is not dependent upon the genotype of the patient, it's dependent upon the environmental experience of the patient. Those mechanisms include DNA methylation. Individual nucleotide sequences are specifically then regulated. The methylation binding proteins are part of that mechanism. However, there can also be histone modification, which is a broader scale turning on or turning off of sets of genes mediated by acetylation, ubiquitination, phosphorylation, and methylation. Also, microRNAs and RNA editing can be involved in these epigenetic processes. We do not yet know which mechanisms are responsible for precisely which of these reactions. Now, the Barker hypothesis has been developed, particularly by Peter Gluckman and his colleagues, into the predictive adaptive response hypothesis. This is a changed developmental strategy with a delayed benefit and no obvious immediate benefit. We know it occurs in other species, for example, altered coat thickness in the meadow vole. Mothers who are giving birth to offspring that will be growing up in cold weather give birth to offspring that already have heavier coats before the weather gets cold, so there is an anticipation involved in that. So we know in principle that can happen. Now there is a bias in anticipation. The fitness cost of an error in prediction is not symmetrical. Predicting a high nutrition environment and ending up in a low nutrition environment will have a greater fitness cost than predicting a low nutrition environment and ending up in a high nutrition environment. So there's a bias in prediction in humans. It's more important to avoid the downside than to exploit the upside. Now an alternative hypothesis is that the effect is a byproduct, not an adaptation, and that the response is aimed at the immediate survival of infants, which contributes strongly to fitness. The costs are paid much later in age classes that contribute less to fitness, so this again is the evolutionary theory of aging. And that leaves open the issue of why the cost must be paid at all. The natural hypothesis is some kind of constraint, but if it exists, it has not yet been located. So this is an area where we know the effects are real, the data are there, and there is an interesting controversy going on in terms of how we explain them. So to summarize, early life events definitely affect late life health and disease. We are beginning to understand how and why these effects evolved, but the evolutionary issues are not yet settled. We are beginning to understand the epigenetic mechanisms that might mediate them. 
and research on the topic is intense. New results are coming in all the time.